behavior of migrating sockeye smolts in the freshwater and early marine environment. So first I'll just start out with a bit of a background on acoustic telemetry and genomics and some previous studies that are directly relevant to my research that have used these techniques to quantify survival and investigate some mechanisms influencing it. And then I'll talk about my research progress so far and show some preliminary results on age one and age two smolt survival as well as some marine migration routes and then summarize and talk about what my next uh, steps will be. So, like Samantha so nicely introduced, there's many factors that can influence sockeye salmon throughout their entire life cycle, but I'll be focusing specifically on the smolt life stage where juveniles are migrating from their natal, uh, freshwater natal grounds towards the ocean. So, an effective way to do this is through the use of acoustic telemetry, in which an acoustic tag is surgically implanted into a smolt, and this tag is continuously emitting a unique code that is picked up by a number of underwater receivers set out throughout their migration route. We can also take non lethal gill biopsies from our tagged fish in order to investigate physiological condition, including uh, presence and load of microbes, as well as immune and stress responses, and uh, osmoregularity preparedness using quantitative, a uh, high throughput quantitative qPCR using the Biomark Fungi platform. So this chip allows us to look at 96 different assays simultaneously and compare those against all of our individual gill samples from our tag smolts. And then we can relate this physiological information back to our tag smolts and their subsequent migration fate. So these te techniques have been used to investigate the survival of Choco Lake sockeye salmon smolts, Choco Lake shown in the red circle there. This population consists mostly of smaller age one smolts, consisting of about 96% of the population on average, and the remaining 4% consisting of a larger age two smolts that have spent an extra winter in the lake before they begin to migrate. And this is a really great population to investigate because it's one of the largest in the Fraser River watershed and is used as a key indicator stock by DFO. And so on this map, the yellow dots here represent uh, the underwater receivers set out throughout their migration route. And it allows us to track smolts from the first uh, over a hundred, or sorry, over a thousand kilometers during their migration. As they migrate out through Chilco Lake, into the Chilco River, Chilcotin, down the Fraser, and out to the Strait of Georgia towards Queen Charlotte Strait. So this, from 2010 to 2014, uh, Clark et al, or I'm sorry, uh, roughly 2,000 small, age two smolts were tagged and tracked during this region. And Clark et al summarized this in their 2016 paper. So on the x-axis, we have the distance from release at Chilco Lake, zero being the release site. On the y-axis is survival. And they found, and on the top region there is the different segments of survival. <coughs> So they found that survival ranged from 63 to 90% just in the first 14 kilometers. It was 21 to 48% uh, to the mouth of the Fraser. And then finally, juvenile survival ranged from 3 to 10% all the way to the last array in Queen Charlotte Strait. In order to look at some of the mechanisms influencing survival here, Jeffries et al. took non-lethal gill biopsies from the tagged fish in 2012. And they found that a virus called IHN was most prevalent in the population and um, was seen to be associated with migration fate. So here on the x-axis, we have three survival groups, starting with imminent mortality, which are those fish smolts that died in that first 14 kilometers of migration. So they didn't make it to the first array. Second is river mortality. So those are the smolts that uh, didn't make it to the mouth of the Fraser. And lastly, we have migration survivors, so those are the ones that made it to the mouth of the Fraser or beyond. And on the x-axis here is the relative load of IHN within these individuals. And what I want you to notice is that those smolts that died before reaching the first array had significantly higher loads of IHN than those that survived later on um, down the migration route. So both of these studies, however, 
only tag or only looked at age two smolts, which only make up roughly four percent of the outmigrating population on average. So we still need to know if this is applicable to the age one smaller age one fish that make up the vast majority of the population, as well as if how these mechanisms might be operating in the marine environment. So with my work, I'm using acoustic telemetry to tag and track both age one and age two Chippewa Lake sockeye salmon smolts in order to identify areas of poor survival as well as any influence of size between these age classes on survival. I will then link this with uh, non-lethal gill biopsies to assess any link between microbes and physiological condition for both age classes on into the marine environment. To do this, in 2016, I tagged roughly 300 sockeye smolts at the outlet of Chilco Lake at this DFO counting fence shown here. And using smaller V4 tags, I was able to tag the smaller H1 fish for the first time, along with uh, roughly 100 H2 fish using the larger V7 tags that have been used in the past. I also took <coughs> non-lethal gill biopsies from half of the H1 fish and roughly 90% of the H2 fish. So this is just an animation showing the migration of the smolts leaving Chilco Lake and going into the Strait of Georgia. So the orange dots are the arrays, and the red dots are the H1 fish, blue dots are H2 fish. And you might notice that the H1 fish seem to all kind of end at the second to last array there in Johnson Strait. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that they all died there, it's just the last array that we were able to pick up the V4 tags. <laughs> so looking at cumulative survival, here again we have distance from release on the x-axis and survivor, uh, survival on the y-axis and the different regions along the top. And just in that first 80 kilometers we see an initial drop in survival, so up into that point shown by it circled in the map where H1 fish dropped to 56% and H2 fish dropped to roughly 41%. As they entered the Fraser River, survival remained fairly consistent, with H1 fish staying at 56% and H2 fish dropping to uh, 28%. And then once smolts entered the marine environment, we saw another drop in survival, with H1 fish ending up at 16% and H2 fish about 2%. The H2 marine survival here is shown by dotted lines because we only had two individuals who actually made it to the marine environment, and so it was too few to include into our model, but it's just showing that at least two individuals were there. And to put this back into context, then, of what we've seen in previous years, the trends overall seem to be quite similar. Age one fish follow the survival trends pretty roughly, uh, fit into the survival trends pretty well from previous years, and the age two seem to have a bit lower survival in that initial 80 kilometers, However, the confidence intervals do overlap with previous years, so it, it is still within that range. Looking at segment-specific survival in order to identify some, any mortality hotspots, we do see that in that first 14 kilometers, both age one and age two fish had relatively low survival. So age one fish dropped to 66, or sorry, 76%, and age two fish down to 53%, which is pretty drastic considering such a short distance. Looking into the marine environment, H1 fish had uh, looks to see, it seems as though they had an initial drop in survival upon entering the ocean. However, it's important to keep in mind here that there is a large error bar. Also, this is about twice the distance as the subsequent array to just from Discovery Islands to Johnson Strait. So you probably noticed that H2 fish had lower survival than H1 fish, which is surprising considering that uh, survival is usually positively correlated with fish body size. So there are a few different things that could be going on here. Potentially, H2 fish might be more conspe uh, conspicuous to predators. There's some lab studies that have shown that odd-sized fish within schools tend to be targeted more by predators. <coughs> there could also be an impact of tag burden here. So this is the ratio of the weight of the tag to the weight of the fish. H2 fish did have slightly higher tag burden than H1s. Uh, averaging at 10% versus 7. However, we did a 12-day holding study and saw high survival in both age classes 
And so this suggests that there are other factors at play. Potentially, for example, a weak fish hypothesis, and that the age two fish are those from the previous year that weren't big enough to uh, migrate as one-year-olds. And so they might just be the slowest growing fish or weakest fish within the population. Also, uh, microbes and physiological conditions have an influence here, which I'll be able to get at later with my genomic work. So we also looked at travel routes through the Discovery Islands, as Samantha explained so nicely in her talk. So through this area, smolts have three different options they can take. They can move through Discovery Passage on the west side, Siddle Channel in the middle, or Desolation Sound on the east side. And so we have uh, a receiver race through each of these channels. And we saw that 10 fish took uh, Discovery Passage, and of those, four survived to Johnson Strait. Nine fish took Siddle Channel, and of those, two survived to Johnson Strait, and one fish took Discovery Passage, or sorry, Desolation Sound, and survived to Johnson Strait. And we did have seven fish move through here with an unknown route because they weren't detected on any of these arrays, but they were detected at Johnson Strait. So just to summarize, it appears that site-specific survival is similar among years, with initial drop in survival in the upper tributaries as well as on ocean entry. There might be a potential that age one survival is higher than age two fish. Although we have small sample sizes in the marine environment, it's interesting to think about how root selection through the Discover Islands might influence survival. And lastly, my genomic work is currently in uh, progress, which will allow me to, or give me some insight into the pathogen profiles, as well as molecular indices of condition, and how these might be influencing the survival and or behavior of both age classes. With that, I'd like to thank everybody who made this work possible and has helped out with providing funding.